Okay, so um, just some quick kind of housekeeping -y stuff. Um, so uh, thank you everybody for joining. Um, I'm Corrine Wallach and um, I'm helping with a lot of like the community and developer experience -y stuff with like the Apache Pino folks. Um, and uh, today we are going to watch Chinmay Soman do a great presentation on intro to Apache Pino. It is going to be very welcoming to anybody who's like super early. And if you have any questions and don't hesitate to ask, even if they feel super green, you know, um, because this is definitely like an intro level um, kind of webinar, but he will be digging into a bunch of different things. I'll let him explain what the agenda kind of looks like. Um, so just a couple things. Um, obviously you can chat in chat room um, or chat in the chat. Uh, we do have some folks here that are heavily contributing like PMCs and contributors for the Apache Pino project. Um, so they'll be able to answer a lot of questions in the chat and we can also do a and a afterwards too. Um, so if there's questions that like require a little bit more uh, further explanations, we can do a kind of Q&A at the end of the presentation. Um, also, if you are not already, we welcome you to join the Pino Slack. Um, I posted two links in the chat. One is for the Pino, just like landing page website thing. And then the other one is uh, for the Slack. You can go either way to get to the Slack invite. Also, if you happen to see this presentation and you're like, this is so cool, I love Pino so much, please give us a cool star on GitHub because it makes us feel very happy and it makes the contributors want to contribute more. So we keep got to keep doing that. Um, and also, uh, if you are watching this video, so we are going to be recording this video, we will publish it online. And if you happen to be watching it on YouTube, please like it. And you can also subscribe to the Apache Pino YouTube, which we will be continuously publishing more content. It's still fairly new, um, but that's the YouTube link. So I've posted a bunch of things as I'm talking. And, um, and yeah, I think that basically covers the basic housekeeping. And um, I will introduce Chinmay now. Hey all, uh, this is Chinmay. Oh, I was going to uh, introduce you. Do you want, I'll introduce you. Oh, okay. Go ahead. <laughs> it, it's a little bit more of a <laughs> fancier entrance. Okay, so Chin May currently works as an engineer at a stealth startup company. Previously, um, he led the streaming platform team at Uber for building a large scale self-serve platform around messaging, stream processing, and OLAP technologies. Um, and before that, he worked at LinkedIn and IBM focusing on distributed systems and security. Um, he's a PMC and member of the Apache Samza and also part of the other open source projects, including Pino, U, Replicator, and Athena X. Um, so just for some background, they, um, him and a few other folks, like some early contributors of Pino, are working on some cool technology around Pino. So if you do, if you see this presentation and you are interested in using Pino and you need some help like running or running Pino or setting it up, um, feel free to reach out to us. You can reach out to me, you can reach out to Chinmay, or you can also reach out to Uday. He's also in the chat here. Uday, hi, say hi. And um, and that's it, Chinmay, I'll let you take it away. Awesome, thanks so much for the intro. Yeah. Yeah, so today I'll be uh, talking about all things related to Apache Pino, starting with the uh, use cases that, that uh, Pino is commonly used for. Uh, I'll give a high level overview of Pino for those who haven't heard of it at all. Uh, we'll also go through the, the architecture deep dive, look at all the different components of Pino, how they interact with each other, and also look at the data layout, indexing strategies, and so on. And finally, uh, we'll, we'll go through a quick demo where we can we'll, I'll show how to onboard a new table and query data within, within Pino. So hopefully this, this should be interesting for all of you. Um, so, so let's just jump right in. Uh, when we talk about real-time analytics, there's actually many different types of use cases that, that fall under this uh, banner. The, the most important real-time analytical use case is actually what we call as user-facing analytics. Uh, so this is where you're exposing your analytical capabilities directly to your end users. So uh, one, a good example, one of the best examples 
and by the way uh, if other people can use oh, i think mute. there's a is, is there somebody off of mute? yeah we have to okay i'm muting i hold on i'm muting some people that were sorry about that uh okay i think we're all good now there was somebody's phone was on all right um so yeah one of the best examples of user facing analytics is linkedin uh, it has a bunch of these uh, products uh, one of them as you most of you might know this is who viewed my profile um, so whenever you visit uh, this feature it's going to show you a week by week statistics of the profile views uh, for yourself uh, another example is the, the linkedin feed ranking uh, so whenever you visit the linkedin homepage uh, the feed ranking algorithm kicks in to make sure you're not seeing the same thing again and again. In other words, for any given story or content, we want to know how many times has a given user seen it in the last 14 days or so, which, which looks something like this. So it seems like a simple aggregation with some filters and group by, uh, so it seems straightforward, but the performance requirements of a query like this is quite severe. Um, for one, it has to execute against the entire user database of LinkedIn, uh, which is 700 million plus at this point. Uh, also, for all active LinkedIn users, whenever they visit the homepage, this, this query is going to fire, uh, which translates to multiple thousands of QPS queries per second. And each such query has to execute very quickly, uh, almost in real time. In this case, it's like the requirement is less than 100 millisecond P99. Otherwise, it's going to be a terrible experience for the users. Uh, another example is from Uber. Surprise, surprise. Uh, so Uber Eats actually has a product uh, called Restaurant Manager, which is given to all the owners of the restaurants that are delivering with Uber. So when, when they open this tool, they see a dashboard, something like this. It's showing you the sales statistics uh, across a, a wide time range uh, and also showing things like missed orders or inaccurate orders that need immediate attention and so on. Uh, similar to before, um, the queries themselves seem straightforward, but in terms of performance, uh, we are again looking at half a million uh, users, the restaurant owners. Uh, the restaurants themselves. Uh, we have multiple hundreds of QPS. And again, each one has to execute uh, very quickly. So both these are examples uh, of analytical queries that, that have, are very high throughput, low latency in nature and are user facing in, in, in general. Uh, another category is business metrics um, and the ability to detect anomalies in real time. So for example, it's very important to know uh, when, for example, in case of LinkedIn, you want to know if the page views suddenly drop uh, at a given point in time. Or if you're Uber, you want to know if the demand and supply ratios are suddenly off for a given region. Uh, so you have, you can imagine these are the business metrics plotted and you can figure out the anomalies on a threshold, um, but, What's more important is the ability to do a drill down across different dimensions to figure out exactly what happened. And this is what we call as root cause analysis. And, and both of these uh, are, uh, is, it's great to have them real time in nature. And finally, we have the dashboard, which I guess everyone is, has, uh, is familiar with in one way or the other. Um, you know, you, you want to plot all your business metrics, charts, and graphs all in one area for your internal operators or SREs to monitor. And again, uh, you know, each dashboard can execute a complex query, and uh, it's ideal to have them return very quickly. So these are just some of the categories of real-time analytics, and there's more. But if you step back, uh, you start seeing some trends. Um, all of these use cases are interested in uh, analyzing the recent data at a fine granularity. So you want to look at every single event which, is, uh, which has been generated in the last few seconds or minutes. Um, they're also interested in looking at an aggregate view of the historical data. 
So some or count of things over the last week or months, that's also of interest. And again, the, both these things, the query latency is expected to be low. That, that's uh, one of the key uh, themes of all these use cases. Um, and if you look at the evolution of how analytics generally evolves in these companies, pretty much everyone starts with uh, basic monitoring. So these are the dashboards that we saw earlier. Uh, you have the internal operators. Uh, for example, Uber has uh, lots of city ops in every single region in the world, or uh, even SREs that, that look at these dashboards. Um, and then you have you have data scientists, uh, PMs, and executives that want in on the action and want to understand, uh, get derive insights from real time data, be able to triage events that just happen. So both these are sort of internal uh, analytical use cases within the company. And then some companies like Uber and LinkedIn have started to monetize this capability. So through uh, as you saw in LinkedIn and Uber's case, they're actually get giving this directly in the hands of the external users uh, and, and uh, getting a, a lot of value for the user. So it's worthwhile to note that a lot of companies are already doing this today, but they may choose to use different technologies for implementing each of these use cases. Uh, if, if, so we, we think all of this can actually be done by, by one core technology, which is Apache Pinot. So for those who, who haven't heard Apache Pinot at all, it is a, a distributed system. It's a distributed columnar database that can ingest data from a wide variety of sources. Uh, for example, Kafka or S3, or, or you have you know, GCS and so on, or TFS and make this data, all this data available to do analytical queries in real time. So you can uh, have all your data ingested in Pino and build all kinds of user facing or internal uh, products uh, on top of Pino. Um, it is a mature system at this point. Uh, it's being used in a lot of big data companies across the globe. Uh, we're looking at 30 plus, 35 plus uh, companies using this in production. And we're also growing uh, pretty big on the community side. We're almost at 900 now. Um, and in terms of scale, uh, Pinot clusters are known to handle a, a large scale of production use cases. Um, some of the largest numbers are here. The largest Pinot cluster can handle upwards of a million events per second, can easily ha handle multiple hundreds of thousands of queries per second, while still maintaining a low query latency. Uh, so it, it, the SLA guarantees uh, are, are achieved uh, in, in, in even on the largest cluster. Um, so let's at this point let me uh, talk about the internals of Pino and and how it achieves uh, all these things. So as I mentioned before, um, Pino can ingest data from a, a lot of different sources. So you, can, you have uh, you know, Kafka or Kinesis as a real-time source where you're getting one event at a time. Uh, you can also get the data from an offline source such as HDFS and S3. And what's cool is Pino can uh, ingest, uh, ingest data from both real-time and offline for the same table. So you can, it consolidates uh, both real-time and offline data and provides one logical view to the user. The other thing that you can do is also have your OLTP data. So if you have, you know, using MySQL or Cassandra, uh, you can have the CDC or the change log stream come out of those databases and also ingest it into Pino uh, through Kafka or HDFS. And so once the data is in Pino, you can build all these different products uh, as, as you saw before. Uh, so let's look at how Pino uh, organizes data internally. So it will take the both the real-time and offline data and distribute it across a bunch of servers in, in the cluster. Uh, it uses something known as a controller to, to decide what data goes where, how the data is replicated and partitioned, uh, and it stores, it uses Zookeeper to, to maintain all of the state. 
and finally uh, it uses something known as a broker to uh, to support the the user queries so whenever any of these products uh, send a query to the broker it will look up the the state from zookeeper and do a distributed scat scatter gather to to uh, process the query so let me give you uh, one scenario to to uh, explain this in a little bit more detail so let's let's take a real example we have uh, we have a kafka topic with four partitions uh, as shown by the different uh, colors here and we have four servers uh, and then we want to ingest a real time table into pino so the very first thing the pino controller will do is to is look at the kafka topic and identify there are four partitions and for each of these partitions it will uh, assign a segment um, uh, for ingesting data from that partition a segment here is a unit of uh, data partitioning and replication and I'll, I'll talk about it in the in the next uh, slide or so so in this case not only has it uh, created assigned segments it, it also assigns the segments to different servers uh, as shown here and and this is what we uh, uh, call as routing information once this metadata is is created in zookeeper the different servers will uh, will actually start ingesting data from the respective Kafka partition and create a local segment on, on any of those servers. Now with any good distributed system, you want to make sure data is replicated. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's configure this table to have a replication factor of two. So with that information, the controller will, uh, will actually assign the segment uh, to two unique servers for each set segment. And again, the servers will, will get, the, uh, once the metadata is updated, they will be triggered and, and start uh, replicating the data uh, and creating local segments. So at this point, the data is flowing from Kafka to all these servers. Uh, and then they're just getting stored as a local segment uh, on, on the local disk. Now when the, the Pinot broker gets a query, uh, something like this it will look up the the routing information and and know where which servers i need to communicate with to to process this query so essentially what it does is it it passes down the query to each uh, each set server each server in turn will take that query and and execute it for the local segments that it has and return an intermediate result to the broker and then the broker will do a final aggregation and, and return the response back to the user. So this is for the for a real time uh, Pinot table. Uh, things work a slightly differently for the offline table. So you have so let's imagine instead of Kafka, you have your raw data sitting somewhere, uh, maybe in HDFS or S3. Uh, we can run a process to convert this raw data into Pinot segment and, and store it in, in a well-known location known as a segment store. Uh, and you know you can use standard frameworks like Apache, like the Apache Spark and Fling. Um, and these frameworks, once the segments are generated, will notify the Pinot controller about the location of these generated segments. And then the Pinot controller will do similar things. It will update the metadata and the servers will fetch the segments and copy it uh, locally from the segment store. Uh, one thing to note is recently we have added the ability to import this data uh, natively within Pinot. So we have a background task, which will do all of this and automatically import the data in, into Pinot. Uh, and, and so the other good point to note here is you can have both real-time and offline flows set up for the same table. Uh, so within Pinot, uh, the, you'll have different servers doing uh, real-time and offline segments, but from a user perspective, they will not really see the difference. Uh, for them, it shows as one logical view and they can query both real-time and offline data sets uh, as one table. And in general, this is a, a great 
design for a distributed system because you have if any at any point of time you are you're running out of capacity all you do is you simply add more servers uh, the controller will identify these servers and start creating new segments onto those servers. So it, it's easily, it's very easy to scale uh, in terms of capacity as well as in terms of performance. So as promised, let's look at the Pino segment in a little bit more detail. This is this is really the secret sauce behind uh, Pino's low latency uh, performance. So let's assume on the left, we have some raw data, um, which we need to convert into a Pino segment. So internally, the way Pino lays out data is in a columnar format. So it will take each of these columns and, and, uh, and align it uh, together uh, in, 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 a, in, in a contiguous manner. So as you can see, whenever you get a query like this, you need to do a count star where country is US, it can easily satisfy this by just scanning this one column, which is a country column. So just using the columnar format, we're already, uh, we can already speed up the, the query execution as compared to the scans on the raw data. So this is great. But the other, but what the unique thing about Pino is it is the ability to support all kinds of indexes uh, on any of these columns. So for example, uh, you can also, you can specify an inverted index uh, on any of these columns. So in this case, uh, we are defining an inverted index on the country column. Uh, so for executing this query, now I only need to look up the entry corresponding to US. Uh, and uh, you can imagine the execution is much faster. Similarly, you can add a sorted index, uh, which uses a form of run length encoding uh, and, and this is even faster in, in some cases it's even faster than the inverted index um, and there's another example uh, this is the most powerful index uh, that we know has it is known as the star tree index um, so the star tree index allows you to maintain pre-aggregated values for certain combination of dimensions so in this case, we are defining the dimensions of the country and the browser. And for executing this one query, uh, all you need to do is a lookup of a one single value, essentially. So this, with the star tree index defined, uh, your, your performance of your query is, is real time in nature. It, it almost seems like an OLTP database at that point. Uh, so it, it allows like millisecond level query latency. So you can, you can define all kinds of indexes uh, on, on top of any of these columns. Uh, we constantly keep adding more and more types. For example, at this point, we have JSON indexes, uh, geospatial indexing, uh, we have bloom filters and, and text search indexes and so on. Uh, and one thing to note is this can be defined at any point, at any point of time. You do not have to uh, do the date all, do all the data modeling before creating the table. You can always do it after, and, and those indexes will kick in uh, even for your uh, older segments. Um, in terms of the, uh, you know, Pino uses different techniques at different points of the query execution, and it has uh, a support for different types of, for example, data representation. You can you have the columnar storage, you can have the bit packing, uh, you can also have the star tree uh, pre-aggregation as a storage footprint. Um, we can define different kinds of indexing strategies for the filter phase of your query and then similar things for the post filter. So with, at, at when, the, when Pino gets a query, it, it will intelligently decide how to mix and match these different strategies uh, to get low latency for your queries. Uh, so at this point, let me actually switch uh, to, the, to the demo. Um, let, let me actually share my entire screen. We do have some questions too. Do you wanna do the demo now and then ask the questions after or? Uh, we can, yeah, while I set up maybe, 
uh, we can answer some questions. All right, while you set up, that's good. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna start at the beginning. So any insights on the cost for Pino in terms of ingest and query rate? Say we are ingesting about a million events per second, each about one KB in size. What would the cost of a cluster be able to handle a thousand queries per second, each scanning about 10 million records? That might be a good question for Uday. <laughs> you want me to stop sharing? Uh, yeah, we can, we can answer, if we can answer these questions quickly. We can... Okay, um, so let me understand this. Oh, we'll answer some, he did respond with a question, but go ahead. I'm okay. Gonna... Yeah, I mean, uh, as I mentioned before, um, the, the cost of a cluster will come from a couple of different points, right? One is the, the total data that, that you need to manage with columnar compression, uh, you're getting a lot of compression uh, uh, on on your data. So typically, uh, you know, you, you it can be the the data footprint can be reduced by like fifty percent to or even like twenty percent, depending on the data. Uh, so with with columnar format itself and the bit packing and the different um, storage strategies that we use, you already reduce on the total footprint. In addition, with all the uh, the other other thing to keep in mind is for your query performance, you need to have uh, enough you know enough parallelism in, in your cluster. Right? So it's a combination of what indexing are you using, uh, and how how much do you want to uh, do the scatter gather. Right? So I can't give you an exact answer there, but you'll have to play around with all these different strategies. Uh, in in my experience, uh, the the cost of Pino. You know, like serving something like this on Pino versus other uh, options, was, Pino was definitely more efficient in terms of the on-disk and in-memory footprint, uh, and needed a smaller cluster. Cool. Uh, next question. Hopefully that answers the question. If it doesn't, we can definitely elaborate more at the end if you have additional questions. So um, we have three more. So let's just try to like if we can. Let, let Cap it at three more and then we'll switch to the demo. Yeah, yeah. So is the data flow down if Zookeeper is down? Uh, no. So once the, I mean, the there are some things that they, once the Pino servers are ingesting data, that will that will continue to happen. However, at some point when we need to create new segments, uh, that is that's not going to be possible if the Zookeeper is down. Also, uh, yeah, I mean, it'll create issues on the query side as well. Okay, cool. Uh, from an operational perspective, is it typical or logically, or is it like logical to separate real time and offline servers? Yeah, good question. So the the thing to note here is the uh, performance characteristics of real time and offline servers are, are different. Um, in, in case of real time servers, when it's consuming data from something like Kafka, it is keeping things, some of the stuff is actually in, in uh, Java Heap. Uh, and and uh, we do have the ability to offload a lot of it to, to off heap uh, memory, but that's the key distinction. So we want to have a different uh, server profile for the real time server and a different profile for the offline server. Nice. Okay, so how about we switch one to the- more. Oh, did you- okay, go ahead. We'll do one, one last. more question. One, this is the last one from the three. Four. So, uh, does it support an open columnar format like Parquet or a closed format? Right. Yeah. Great question. So, right now it is a closed format, um, but we are there are talks to also support things like Parquet, uh, at least from a data ingestion point of view. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, I think we're good. We can continue. Thank you. Sure. So, in this demo, uh, I'll. Uh, walk through uh, so, so what we're going to do here. Um, so this is actually part of our uh, documentation. So if, you, if you're new to Pino, I highly recommend uh, you know doing playing with this on your own. Uh, what in this demo, what we'll do here is set up a Pino cluster. So it'll actually bring up all the components like Zookeeper, controller, brokers, and servers. Uh, it'll, it'll internally also create a Kafka cluster uh, and start publishing data from the GitHub events API. Uh, specifically, we are interested in the, the PR merge events, um, which is published into Kafka 
and will be ingested uh, into into pino as a real time table so can you see my uh, the terminal yes we see it um if anybody needs any i mean i think that i think we could see the text you know something that's better okay. good so in the same um in, in in this page you'll see the there's a long version and short version for the for sake of time i'm just going to use a shorter version here um and it's going to go and and you know, start setting up pino kafka um so it, this this page will actually describe all the things it's going to do um so this is a one click one one click uh, demo it sort of brings everything uh ready for ready for you to play around with so you you'll actually get a a, a working pino cluster with data pino already data already i think this is echo okay yeah so, i got it i turned that person off <laughs> taking away your microphone privileges okay um uh, so once this uh, at, at some point uh, your your pino server will start and then you can go to this url localhost 9000 um to see the pino the pino ui right uh here you can look at different components of pino you have if you have one controller one server and one broker for sake of this demo okay and then right now it's showing zero tables because it's still working in the background let's actually take a look right so we have now now it has actually created a, a table already and for each pino table uh, we have a corresponding schema which which uh, defines what's in that table right so let's take a look at this particular example from, from github so this is a predefined schema which comes as part of that demo uh, we have uh, it, it defines a bunch of dimension values uh, dimension columns we have like title author association uh, committers and, and so on these are the dimensions which you will uh, do slicing and dicing on uh, so a lot of the filters can be applied directly on, on these dimensions and then you also have the metrics um, to keep track of the aggregation numbers for your schema and then the other thing the schema also defines is a time column so in this in this particular case we have the merge time release as a time column and uh, the granularity is in terms of uh, epoch uh, uh, milliseconds since some starting time so uh, this schema has been created specifically for the github events api and, and for any any such uh, you know for your data source you can create a similar schema like this and let's also look at the table that was already created for you uh, so here you can see other properties of the table such as you know how much retention do you want on your table what is the replication factor um, and also the indexing configuration so in this case uh, the table predefines some inverted index on these two columns which is organization and repo so any any filter queries on on this is bound to be faster uh, than than the cross and you also have the ingestion related properties in this case we are uh, as i mentioned we have an internal kafka cluster so it, it's pointing uh, to that from this lastly we uh, it also shows you the segments that belong to to this table uh, so right now both these segments are hosted on the one server we only have one server um, and we can now start playing with the data that we already have so you can see the schema on your left and and do all kinds of queries here for example let's do a account star so you have 19 rows ingested so far and this is actually it's happening in real time so these are the merge events that that's that's happening on github and we are capturing it within pino so as you can see the count will actually keep increasing and um and then you can do uh, you can play around with whatever whatever you want okay. so this is cool but now what now what we want to do is uh, add an offline component to this table 
So let me remind what we did so far. We uh, we are actually have a real time stream from GitHub that's going into Pino, um, and you can do any sorts of query on it. But what's cool is, uh, let's say you have some historical data for the same event source. Uh, so in this case, it's the uh, I have something like this, which was captured from a few days ago. Right. And this is typical with a lot of use cases. You will have for the same use uh, for the same data source, you'll have a real time source and the historical uh, data somewhere in HTFS or S3. So, what we want to do is now add an offline table for uh, an offline component to the same table with, with, with this data in mind. So, let's do that. Um, the first thing I'm going to do is, is create uh, the offline table which looks something like this, right? So we have the same table name as the real-time table. Um, and then there are some other properties that I'm defining for the offline table. And this is the simplest sort of table config. Uh, we, we're not really adding anything more complicated here. As I mentioned before, you can always change this at runtime, even after the table is created. You can always create new uh, indexes uh, as you wish. Okay, so let's go ahead and create the table. So this will simply create the metadata for that table uh, in, in, in the cluster UI. So now you can see uh, there is for the same table name, there are two components. There's a real time component, which was pre-built in this demo. And there's an offline component, which we created just now. Uh, so it's the same table config, uh, and you can note that it's it's also using the same schema as your real time component. So this this is what sort of ties in the real time and offline tables together, the same schema. And of course, there is no data today since we haven't uh, it, it, we haven't really pushed anything so far. So let's go ahead and do that. Um, what we'll do now is. Uh, the I have the the JSON data somewhere in a file locally. I'm going to run this command. Uh, this is the import data command that was recently added. It will actually take the raw data, generate Pino segments, and, and push it through your Pino cluster. Right? And and this can be again. You know, this is just a demo, but uh, this can be done as part of your production Pino cluster as as a background task. Um, which runs natively in Pino. You could also choose uh, to run your own frameworks like Flink and Spark to do this and then push the data again to Pino. So now, as you can see, the data is actually in, in Pino. And then let's try to now query all this data. So if you note here, we only have one table. It's the same table name, um, but the under underneath it's actually querying both the the real time and offline components so suddenly you see a lot of rows uh, and, and this is clearly not from the real time it's getting from both uh, from both the data sources uh, and then you can uh, just play around with some queries just to show you know typically what you can do uh, you can do a group by On the author on the association. So here we are categorizing the count by uh, the type of uh, author. Uh, you could also do simple filters. Uh, for example, let's see, so num or num lines added is greater than thousand, for example, and maybe num committers is more than one. And then same group by query, right? So you can you can imagine you can play around uh, with any any sort of queries. Uh, as you can see, the time used here is is small. Um, although I have a the data set itself is not big, uh, but you can add any kind of indexing on these dimensions to make it even faster. So let's go back to so this this is in this way you can. 
uh, have like a hybrid table of both real time and offline, and the users really don't know what's happening underneath. They see one logical view um, or query. Uh, as I mentioned before, the the performance of your queries will be impacted a lot by the choice of indexes that you define uh, on your table. So these are some of the, st the stats from, uh, uh, not from this demo, but from a larger use case that we analyze. So this is a simple aggregation with filter query. Uh, the raw scan, as you can see here, is taking almost 2.5 seconds. Uh, and the performance uh, drastically improves with different strategies that we have added here. So with the bloom filter, it becomes like one, almost like a one second down to one second. And with sorted and inverted indexes, we're down to like millisecond level granularity. This is another uh, type. Uh, Pino also supports a range index. So if you have select count star where um, where the, the time is greater than uh, some, some time in the past, th those kind of things in a raw scan will take a lot of time. As you can see, 40 seconds here. Whereas with the range index, uh, it's, it's much, much lower. Similar thing with a text index, you can do um, things like regects, uh, regex like uh, filter queries. Um, and with the text index will give you real time latencies in that case. And finally, we have the, the uh, start index, uh, which is even faster than things like inverted index. Uh, as I mentioned before, start tree will actually have pre-materialization of, of some combination of dimensions uh, so it's almost like a lookup of values. Um, but the cool thing is it doesn't really, uh, the, it, it, there's a way to control the right amplification uh, even with the star tree index. So you don't explode your data footprint uh, e even with something like star tree. So Pino has a lot of these different kinds of indexes. Um, and and it, I think we, this is a simple comparison uh, with Pino and, and the other common uh, technologies that are used for such use cases. Um, and, and I think the, where Pino shines is things like star tree index, the, the geo index, which was added recently, uh, same thing with JSON index and, and so on. Uh, the, the whole point of, of Pino is the whole, the pluggability aspect of it. So you can keep adding these different kinds of strategies and apply them uh, to your existing data set. Uh, which, which will uh, speed up your queries without having to re-bootstrap all your data. So I'll, I'll stop here and maybe you can take more questions. Uh, but before we go, uh, you know, if, if you're interested to learn more, this is again a high level intro. I'm sure there are more questions. Uh, please join our Slack channel. Uh, I've sent the link, uh, I've given the link here and I'll share the deck after this. And you can find us on Twitter at Apache Pino. I'm sure Karin has more to share in that regard. Yeah, I can share. Um, I also just posted in the chat if anybody has any other questions, because it's kind of hard to keep up with what questions have been answered and what hasn't. Because I see there was like, there were some questions about the server going down, like what happened to the data and how, you know, um, like uh, some things about like backup and restore strategies and things like that. But it looks like it's been answered. Um, and there, what it happens if the offline table is unavailable or the queries slow down? Um, I think that one might've been addressed too. Um, but I put it out there. If anybody has any questions now that you wanna ask Chinmay, you can just post them in the chat now and then we can ask him uh, directly. That works. Chinmay, great presentation. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I'm going to post in the channel too, in the chat while everybody is hopefully writing their questions, like you can ask, prepare your questions now. Sometimes it takes a minute to write it out. So while, um, while we're waiting, oh, okay. Uh, what is the query language and query limitations? Yeah, uh, so uh, as of now, we are supporting the, uh, the CalCite query semantics. Um, so uh, we, we used to have a uh, proprietary one, but we're now switching to like full SQL. Uh, the, the, there's another dimension to this, right? So Pino natively supports uh, the CalSet query. Um, the other way to, uh, other thing that companies are also doing is to have things like Presto on top. So you can, uh, there's a Presto Pino integration that, that we contribute. 
and you can do all kinds of complicated presto queries uh, and we uh, the connector does uh, an intelligent job of pushing down a lot of the filters uh, filter predicates and aggregation queries so it's much faster than traditional presto um, uh, and, and and on top it also gives you the flexibility to do things like joins um, all all kinds of udfs that you want to apply on top of presto and so on. but the native pino does support calcite Cool. We do have a couple other questions that came in that are really good. Um, so we have uh, any recommended backup or restore strategies? Yeah. Okay. So let me. And then we have, like, we have like three more that just came in that are really good. So right. Let me let me share the screen again because this okay. is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great question. Um, cool. So let's go back to the um, the data flow. Uh, what I mentioned here is. Uh, as I mentioned before, Pino will get the data either from Kafka or from a secondary storage and store it locally. Um, but what it also does is um, persist all those segments, the segments that are already built in, into, um, uh, into something known as a segment store. Right? This is just another name for an additional storage that you have outside of Pino. And this could be whatever you want. This could be a simple NF NFS filer. It could be HDFS or S3 or GCS. You just configure it uh, as part of your Pino cluster setup. And Pino will automatically archive the built segments uh, into, the, into your segment store. So at any point, if, if a server goes down, uh, for example, it, we, we have a hard disk crash and we need to rebuild the server. All it needs to do, uh, we spin up a new node, a new machine. Uh, it joins the cluster and it automatically downloads the segments uh, from, from the segment store. So this sort of uh, works as a, as a backup strategy as well. It also works great when you need to do cluster expansion and you need to migrate stuff from one server to another, you can also directly copy uh, from, from the segment store. Awesome. Um, was there another, another part to that question? Uh, there isn't another part to that question, unless the, you know, um, the person who asked it, who was, who, um, if they have more, they can definitely elaborate and we can touch base on it again. Um, okay, so Krishna asked, could we replace the typical Spark streaming or Flink like calculation with Pino, and then he said, "I mean, just streaming and no offline table use case." Yeah, uh, you can. Um, so, for example, you can if 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 what you're doing as part of your Spark streaming or Flink is to pre-compute some values. So, for example, you have a bunch of dimensions, and you're computing a metric on on across those dimensions. You don't really need a Flink or Spark job. You can directly ingest the, the raw data into Pino and do these queries on the fly with something like Star Tree Index. So it can, with the Star Tree Index, it, it can handle all that throughput and, and low query latency. So it sort of, uh, it, it the need to pre-compute is gone with, with this strategy. And that's typically why people would use Spark or Flink in the first place. Cool. But, uh, but one, one thing to note is for complex things, for example, if you want to do joins uh, before the data is ingested into Pino, for example, you have uh, OLTP streams coming from different uh, tables from MySQL, and you want to normalize the data, uh, denormalize the data into one schema, that join uh, has to be performed into in something like Spark or Flink. Uh, and then you can ingest the the resulting stream into Pino. Cool. Um, are messaging platforms like RabbitMQ, ActiveMQ supported as a source? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, as I said, Pino is pluggable, so it's easy to add a new source. At this point, we are working on the Kinesis support, which will be out soon. Uh, I don't believe we have uh, those two specifically yet, uh, but it's easy to add it uh, as a source. Um, if anybody else has any other questions for Chinmay, now is your chance to ask. It's not your only chance forever, but it is your chance to ask. 
Um, uh, and also just a reminder to like, while we're waiting for people to probably ask their questions, um, just a reminder that um, that there are some folks from the Pino contributing team, founder, the founding contributing team, I don't know exactly what the right the authors, um, that are building some cool technology around Pino. And if you need any help running Pino or set it, setting it up, you can either reach out to Uday, to Chinmay, to me. Um, here's Uday's email address. <laughs> if you want to just contact him directly, but he also is here and he's also on the, uh, the Pino user Slack. Okay, somebody asks, Bauman asked, what is the resource impact of using Pino storage and compute? Um, I'm not sure I understand. Can you can you clarify what do you mean? Um, do you mean do you mean how much CPU memory we need for each of these? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Okay, we'll give him a give him a moment yeah. to elaborate. Um, so Krishna, we will be uh, we will be publishing this uh, YouTube link online. I think we can also probably put uh, the slides up on SlideShare or something. Um, right. Yeah, I think he, he clarified it well. How much extra storage do we need? Yeah, so um, it's it's so so when Pino uh, will Pino does need a local copy of the segments today to execute queries. So essentially, you need to size your Pino cluster based on the data footprint. Uh, and by data footprint, I mean the the derived data footprint, not not the raw data footprint. Um, so it will keep archiving segments in deep store, but it, today uh, it, it needs a local copy to process the queries. We are adding a feature to do lazy loading of segments from the deep store. So it doesn't need necessarily need all the data locally, right? When that feature comes in at that point, we can, we, we may not need as big a local storage as we do today. Cool. Uh, thank you. Hopefully that answers. Uh, also, iPhone asked, how would you do querying when the cardinality of data is very high? Yeah, for, I mean, this is obviously, um, you know, when you do need to figure out the right indexing strategy for uh, that, uh, for a given use case, uh, it, it is going to be, if it is very, very expensive, there are some strategies that uh, even indexing, uh, simple indexing may not solve. Uh, for example, LinkedIn has a bunch of use cases where uh, one of the query dimensions is member ID and then the, the cardinality is obviously very high. Uh, what Pino provides is the, data, is the ability to partition your data uh, on this very high cardinality column. Uh, and that partitioning works uh, hand in hand with the other indexing strategies. So intuitively what that means is you prune the number of segments or the number of servers that you need to query using this partitioning. And then each of those servers will use the local indexes to process the query. So there is uh, a way to, to handle even high cardinality columns in Pino. Um, I think Kishore mentioned the same thing. Yes. Uh, can you throw some light on API SDK? Yeah, um, so I, I mean, we can share it uh, along with the slides, but a lot of that documentation is available online on docs.pnode.apache.org. This is a great uh, resource for you to have for knowing not just high level, but also like low level details of Pino. Um, so here's a simple broker, broker query API um, for you, so you do have an API access, uh, rest, restful API for issuing queries. Uh, for more advanced uh, users, there's also a controller API that you can use to manage your cluster and your table. Okay, um, is, uh, is there a JBDC driver or equivalent? Yes, there is uh, support, there is, um, already work happening in that regard. We do have JDBC uh, support on top of Pino. There will be a blog out soon to explain this in more detail. Um, we, we, we are working to finish uh, at finishing touches on, on in this regard. So it will be out soon. Um, and also 
Well, Mike asked, I was thinking maybe somebody would, um, somebody from our team would answer this. Is there a link to track the lazy loading feature? Yeah, there is, there is one issue. Uh, I can, if someone can look it up, uh, or maybe I can look it up while there's ah. other... <laughs> You're becoming Google. <laughs> it's great. There you go. Cool. There you go. Nice. Thank you. Mike is laughing. <laughs> Good. Good. <laughs> um, yeah. Does anybody have any other questions? Okay. All right. I feel like I like need glasses. Every time I'm like looking at the questions, I'm like. <laughs> um, I think uh, we, are, we are a little bit over the hour, but um, I don't know if you have a hard stop to me or do you want to answer the quick question? I mean, I don't know if people want to, I can stay on for a little bit longer for sure. Okay, we'll do another couple minutes. Um, adding executors dynamically. Auto scaling, yes. Yeah, oh, auto scaling. Yeah, uh, so Pino does have, uh, so first of all, uh, there is, in, you know, the way to deploy using Docker and Kubernetes and all that. Um, and there is a way to do auto scaling as well. Um, we, I can, uh, once we have maybe a good documentation on that, I can, I can be happy to share. Not sure if Shyam is on the line, uh, if you want to share some docs. Uh, Shyam's probably, yeah, he's probably on the uh, I am, so basically, oh, hey. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, basically when we deploy uh, Pino uh, in Kubernetes, there's a way of uh, handling that. And uh, we'll, 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 we'll publish some uh, documentation on that uh, area. Basically, it's like we can deploy more Pino servers. You can scale uh, Pino server instances for example, double the, the instance size, and then they can actually do a rebalancing on all your data. And then basically it's like uh, uh, redistribute all your data. Cool. That was an awesome and convenient that he just popped up. <laughs> um, we have the primitives for, to auto scale, but there's no component that monitor, monitors the metrics and automatically auto scales. Yeah, it has to be done out of band right now. Um, there's, there's obviously API to do it, but not there's no integration. Hmm. Okay, cool. I'm gonna give people one more minute to write sure. out their question really, really, really fast. And if not, then we're gonna we can wrap up. And and Chinmay and the team are also available on the Slack. I'll, I know I posted this like probably four times already, but I'll post it again. Just so it's on the top of everything. Yeah, the thing. Slack is pretty active. Uh, not just the uh, contributors, but like people like Ken and, and other folks uh, are really active. Um, and it, it's, it's a great resource to have to, to learn more or just discuss your specific use case in detail. Mm -hmm. Neha said, great session, Chinmay. Um, uh, and so, also just like really quick before we, because we do have yeah. another question, but really quick, just um, if you guys, liked this uh, presentation and you like, uh, well, if you like the presentation and you're watching it on YouTube, give it a thumbs up. But uh, if you like Pino and you think it sounds really cool, feel free to give us a star on GitHub and make the contributors feel happy. And you can also subscribe to the YouTube and follow on Twitter. Um, Krishna has asked, Krishna has a lot of questions, really digging deep here, just digging. It's great, quote, great questions though. Chidmay loves good questions. Um, is the segment store basically a storage or a platform? Yeah, it's, it's, I mean, think of it like an external storage. So it, as I mentioned, it could be anything. It, it could be NFS, uh, HDFS, S3. You can add your own segment store. Uh, every, pretty much everything in Pino is pluggable and add the protocol to use it. Um, so at this point, uh, for example, Uber is using HDFS as the segment store. And there's companies in the cloud that are using S3 and DCS. Cool. 
Awesome. Should make great session. Sure. No problem. Yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time. And yeah. Thank you all for joining us. For helping everyone learn. <laughs> this Chinmay side hobby as he becomes a technical trainer now. <laughs> <laughs> um, thank you guys all for coming. Um, feel free to like ping us on um, Slack or yeah, Slack is probably the best place to reach everyone. And if you guys have any other questions, please let us know. Um, and also like, if there's any like suggestions, I'm, I'm, my name's Kareen Wallach. I know it says Pino, Pachi Pino on my username, but I'm also on the user uh, Slack. So if you have any ideas on how we can improve the experience for developers like learning, please feel free to like share those thoughts with us too. Um, cool. Awesome. So, yeah, thank you so much. And we'll see you guys all soon. There is other meetups coming up. Um, one that's well, it's probably a little bit more advanced, but you guys can uh, please check out the meetup group. Um, I think I, it's not in here. I didn't put it as one of my links because. Um, Once we share the deck, we can probably share all the, the link in the meetup. The yeah. meetup. Here, I'll put it right, I'll put it right now. I got have it right here on the front. Um, yeah, so feel free to, you know, join our other meetup sessions that we have coming up. That should be good ones. Cool. Thank awesome. you. Thank you all. Take care. Bye.